Welcome, everyone. This is Dean uh, Sanjeev Kagram of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We are honored and privileged to be partners uh, of Orasis and, and Frank Jorgen uh, Richter, who's done such an incredible job. Uh, we at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University pride ourselves in three great accomplishments. Number one is we judge ourselves by who we include and not we, who we exclude. The second is the Thunderbird School is the number one school for global management, where we are committed to understanding uh, global business leadership in the 21st century in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, ensuring that all of our uh, students, faculty, staff, alumni, partners around the world uh, understand regional business and, uh, and political environments, engage in, with respect uh, and trust across cultures. And third, really uh, bring the world together in these very difficult times. We were founded on the principle that borders frequented by trade seldom need soldiers. Uh, Arizona State University has been ranked number one for innovation ahead of Stanford and uh, MIT for the last six years running. So we pride ourselves on inclusion, innovation, and impact at global scale. We have a, a wonderful regional center of excellence in Africa. And myself, this is a very personal and important topic to me as Ugandan born and, and the child of Ugandan and Kenyan parents. I want to welcome our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have a fabulous panel to talk about Africa, uh, Africa's incredible potential, uh, and not just potential, but what is already happening that is dramatically changing the landscape economically, socially, politically, and environmentally. Uh, we have wonderful ministers, including uh, our wonderful friend, uh, Wamkele Mene, who I'll introduce first, the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area in Ghana. He took this incredible position as that Africa became the largest open free trading block in the world just in 2019. Obviously, then the pandemic hit. So I want to welcome Wamkele. Thank you so much for Thank you. That's my Thank friend. you very much. <laughs> I want to in Thank you. Good to see you. It's great to have you. I want to introduce uh, our wonderful Thunderbird alum, uh, the Minister of Trade and Industry in Rwanda, Soraya Akizurame. Thank you so much, Minister, for joining us, Your Excellency. Uh, we are so proud of you, and we know that you are doing incredible work, not only in Rwanda and East Africa, but across the continent and internationally. Uh, uh, we are just uh, have a rock star panel here. We have the Minister of Information of Eritrea and the former director for the Office of the President, uh, Yamene uh, Garuzetse. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for joining us, Your Excellency. And last but certainly not least, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Benin, uh, Orlen Egbenonchi. Uh, we are so proud and privileged to have you, sir, uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, I want to start with you, Wamkele, to just jump right into the mm -hmm. conversation because we have such a wonderful audience and such a great topic. 2019 was a historic year because of the uh, African Free Trade Agreement. And certainly all of those of us who are Africans and around the world that are supporters and partners saw this as a, as the world was closing in so many parts, right? Africa was opening. Tell us what brought this historic achievement about. Well, first, let me uh, once again thank you for, for inviting me uh, to be part of this session uh, tonight. And um, I want to also thank the, the other panelists, the honorable ministers and the organizers for, for putting this together. Um, I think what's remarkable about what has happened is that as the world, as we saw in the world, an increase in um, protectionism, whether it is uh, trade protectionism, protectionism through tariffs, increased tariffs, the so-called trade wars, or protectionism in the form of barriers to investment, we as Africans were going the opposite direction. We were reducing barriers to trade, reducing uh, barriers to intra-Africa investment, and all of that culminated in this African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that we have today, which has been signed by um, 54 countries out of 55 in Africa, has been ratified by 28 countries. We expect four more ratifications in the next few months, um, making this the fastest agreement to be ratified under the African uh, Union. This signals um, the political commitment, the legal commitment to reducing barriers to intra-Africa trade, 
to um, reducing, as I say, investment to intra-Africa trade. And so I think we, we as Africans uh, um, have uh, achieved quite a lot under the, um, the leadership of the Assembly of Heads of States, of course, who have been pushing us for the last four to five years to move much faster in negotiating this agreement. The ultimate objective is this. We want by 2035 to double intra-Africa trade, which of course is relatively low compared to uh, North America, um, uh, compared to Europe. Our intra-Africa trade is uh, the best figure that I've seen is at 15%, um, which is very, very low. So we want to make sure that as we boost intra-Africa trade, we focus on Africa's industrial development Building our productive capacity is a very, very important part of um, Africa's industrialization. And so as we as we um, confront, uh, you know, this COVID-19 crisis, it has slowed us down. But our our resolve and our determination is um, is not diminished at all. In fact, well, Kelly, if I could ask you one more question before going to our wonderful minister. Excellence. Um, Say more about the pandemic. Uh, what is your view, uh, what is the institution's view about the potential uh, for recovery uh, and transformation that the pandemic has uh, potentially created for uh, the African free trade uh, um, sort of advancement? Well, I, I, I was elected by the Assembly of Heads of States in February, and it seemed as if at that time, um, it seemed as if we were going to have a normal year. Um, and about three weeks later, things changed uh, dramatically, including my swearing in statement that I had to redraft uh, to take account of COVID-19. Yeah. And in that um, statement, um, one of the things that I had to recognize was that the world had changed. We now have to confront this pandemic. And I think one of the lessons we have learned is that um, Africa has got to accelerate industrial development to establish uh, regional value chains across the African continent to enhance our productive capacity so that we are better able to confront a, a future pandemic that will come. Uh, because when there is a global disruption in uh, global supply chains, it impacts Africa negatively we have seen this with the, at the beginning of the onset, onset of the pandemic. We saw the distortion of uh, global markets for these critical goods that we need to fight the pandemic. Uh, the personal protection equipment, uh, the germ killing products, um, where there was a high demand uh, and we import the majority of these products. And so we, we, I think we recognize that there is a fundamental weakness in our productive capacity. We've got to correct that. The second lesson we learned is that um, the, we need to re-look at our, at our intellectual property rights to, to make an assessment as to whether our intellectual property rights facilitate um, the, the public health imperatives of Africa whether or not um, the, the intellectual property regime in Africa enables um, millions and millions of Africans to have access to affordable health care and access to affordable uh, generic medication. I think all of these things are lessons that we've learned from COVID-19. The last point I would make is that unlike other parts of the world that have the monetary policy space, the fiscal policy space to provide these very large bailouts, uh, economic recovery package um, uh, packages to their domestic economy to re-inject dynamism. Many African countries don't have that. What we have is this agreement, and I've, I've made this point before, where we aggressively implement this agreement to boost intra-Africa trade. That is the best hope as Africans that we have for a post-COVID-19 recovery, if there will be a post-COVID-19 world, but that is the, the recovery tool that we have, boosting intra-Africa trade so that it becomes the driver um, for, for an economic recovery uh, on the African continent.
Thank you so much, my dear friend, Mam Keller. Uh, Minister Bonenti, can we ask you, uh, Benin, the same question? What has been the progress in Benin prior to the pandemic in terms of economic transformation, policy reforms, and making Benin ready for the 21st century? Minister, Your Excellency, welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Can you hear me? We can, sir. Okay. Uh, I think before I answer your question, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Frank Jürger, Richter, the president of Horasis, for inviting me to take play part of uh, part of, to, uh, in this uh, meeting. And this is, uh, of course, happening in a special time when we have to break with habit and experience uh, new social interaction using information and uh, communication technologies. Um, it's true that before COVID-19, we understood that the full potential of ICT is, uh, is huge, but uh, now this potential is really being uh, implemented at a great speed. And since this morning, I understand that the number of uh, prestigious speakers have taken the floor uh, for this all the event, which is taking place exclusively online. To, to answer to your question, I must tell you that uh, in Benin, uh, since uh, 2016, we are experiencing a, a new momentum. Uh, we have decided to change totally the way we do business. Uh, and uh, we are transforming the political, economical, and social structure in our country uh, because uh, we have a potential. And if we don't uh, change the way we do business, uh, we will not make it. Uh, with the democratic uh, demographic rates that we, 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 we are having here, is important that we change. So, to come to a concrete um, uh, case of Benin, I think uh, first of all we start having a good government action program, in which we agree on the objective where we want to take Benin for the next five years and maybe for the next ten years also. Secondly, we try to work with our, all our development partners, uh, but not only uh, those who are uh, uh, in development strategies, but also financial institutions, uh, because you have to mix those who are in strategy, those who can uh, help you in, uh, in, in, in design some policies, with those who can put the resources, those who can help you to go to the global market. That is very important. So we put that together, and now we have a national development plan on which we are working. So, um, based on uh, all this, we have decided to conduct some drastic reforms of, of, uh, of, our, of our economy. Drastic reform also of the political system. Uh, uh, in the past, we used to have up to 250 political parties. It cannot work. This is not democracy. This is uh, 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 everything except democracy, anarchy, we call it. So, we have decided to put some rule and regulation in place that bring all parties to kind of cluster and uh, we, will not, we will end by having maximum six or five or six political parties. This is one. Then we clarify the terms of responsibility of each uh, institution and we clarify also the fact that no one can serve as president in his uh, lifetime more than two times. Uh, that is also very important for us. And uh, we embark on a very drastic fight against corruption because the real problem of Africa is corruption. Uh, we have the institutions, we have, uh, 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 I say, the means, but the way we do business is very sad. Uh, I can see my sister, the Minister of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Trade of Rwanda, and I would like to borrow a quote from President Kagame, who used to tell us that uh, Africa is not poor, it's just poorly managed. And in Benin, we have decided not to, to manage poorly our country. So drastic fight against corruption. Secondly, in the context of the COVID-19, we have taken important measures uh, and to, miti uh, to mitigate the economic effect of the pandemic. And uh, these include uh, support to formal enterprises, we put up to 100 uh, million US dollars to support them. 
because uh, what happened was not expected. And if you don't maintain the machinery of your economy, things will not uh, continue. This is one. Then we decide to support also craftsmen and uh, small trade up to, we put uh, 8.9 million in this. And, and also we try to uh, subsidize for the first time, uh, we provide them with subsidies in, on water and electricity tariff. Well, this cost us like uh, 10.2 million US dollar. And we add to that some complementary measures to support uh, agricultural enterprises and uh, micro and small and medium sized enterprises uh, for an amount of uh, one, almost 200 uh, million US dollar. And I must underscore this because I don't want to keep uh, the, the, take the floor for too long. Governors now imply that state must be able to make structural investments for uh, the long term, but also develop tools and instruments dedicated to dealing with emergency and shocks or shock situations. And this is one of the key lessons we need to learn from this pandemic. Uh, 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 it's important for us to have those tools, to have a, a, a contingency planning, what we call a kind of contingency planning, to face situations like this. And I think uh, these public policies uh, uh, that, is, uh, that are enforced today are necessary and indispensable to create the condition for sustainable and ecological viable growth. Benin has also embraced a path for innovation with a uh, 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 lot of measures, which is the key for the future by reforming education and technical and vocational training system. Uh, let me conclude here by saying that uh, uh, it's important that in order to face uh, uh, national challenges, it is essential for us to build solidarity at global level, promote circulation of financial capital and the transfer of technology and knowledge. Uh, we cannot continue dealing with globalization, which uh, is only uh, uh, managed the way it is, because globalization cannot only result in the in the rapid spread of viruses and threats. It must also allow the diffusion of innovation and gains from exchanges. It is on this condition that it will be able to create new enthusiasm for everyone. Let me let me stop here and uh, listen to my other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Let me welcome again, uh, Minister Soraya, the Minister of Trade and Industry of Rwanda. And I can't hide our pride being a Thunderbird alum. We are especially proud to have you here on the panel, Madam, uh, Your Excellency. We are starting off the conversation really saying prior to the pandemic, uh, each country in Africa and Africa overall was headed in such an incredibly positive direction. All of us of Africans and around the world were so if I may say bullish uh, on the continent, really, uh, and with the African Free Trade Agreement, which you were a leader in, of course, uh, Secretary General Amene, as of course, and many others, there were so many th good things in place. What are some of the key steps you took in the ministry and more broadly in the Ru uh, Rwandan government to set, your, set Rwanda uh, up for the decade of action and success in the 21st century? Welcome, Minister Saraya. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjeev. It's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, uh, I would like to, to pass my greetings to, to Minister Benin, uh, brothers and uh, SG uh, Mene. Um, uh, apologies for uh, joining in late. For, for a country that wants to be an ICT hub, I hope you will forgive me on that. But uh, uh, coming back to your question, uh, Sanjeev, um, uh, what we've been trying to, to achieve as, as Rwanda um, was really to make sure that we can build a conducive business environment that's uh, friendly to investors uh, by mainly conducting three key reforms uh, and uh, around uh, the key pillars. The first one was uh, administrative reforms where we introduced one-stop centers to streamline procedures and make it easy for businesses to acquire all related services under one roof, um, hence the um, uh, establishment of the Rwanda Development Board uh, since 2009, uh, but also introducing specialized organs to provide dedicated provision of investor needs, be it the Credit Reference Bureau, setting up commercial courts, and so forth. The second pillar was regulatory reforms, where we overhauled our commercial regulatory system and to replace archaic uh, colonial laws with modern business-friendly regulations. And these regulatory reforms um, 
paved the way for uh, the administrative reforms, but also made it easier to do business in Rwanda by removing unnecessary red tapes and costs and providing strong protection for creditors, minority shareholders, and also establishing modern labor law um, practices and enabling uh, in um, transactions, which brings me to the last pillar where we tried as much as possible to introduce automation um, with, where so, several key services were um, digitized, uh, being business registration, filing and uh, declaration of taxes um, on one issue that's still very, very much critical for Africa, land registration. Uh, as a result, we were able to provide efficient and transparent services to businesses. One of the examples that, you know, we're really proud of is how we managed to ensure that to register a business in Rwanda, it only takes six hours and that it is free of charge. <clears throat> and these different reforms really allowed us to um, not only, um, you know, become, uh, although some people may say that we were chasing rankings, but uh, the fact that as, as Rwanda uh, in the past 10 years, we've managed to to be one of the top 40 uh, countries in the world where um, in the ease of doing uh, business uh, through the World rank, uh, Bank ranking and the second in Africa, whereas really in 2000 uh, uh, and, and, and five when we started our reforms, uh, we were ranked at 153. <clears throat> so this this really shows, um, you know, that these efforts to to ensure um, that that investors are not only protected but are facilitated in establishing uh, their companies in the country uh, that has uh, paid well. And uh, and maybe I would also. Um, touch upon, um, you know, our experience on, on regional integration, uh, starting with, um, you know, our um, country joining the East African community. That was in uh, 2009. So we still, um, you know, I think one of the last member states uh, after that, there was South Sudan, uh, but where we worked really to ensure that um, uh, we participate in, in, in the customs union, uh, reducing with our neighboring countries, um, non-tariff barriers, uh, harmonizing, for instance, uh, standards um, and, and quality of products, um, and making sure really that, that the supply chains in the regions uh, are assured and protected uh, with different capacity building as well, because this is really one, the first customs union we were joining. And we are uh, we're really happy to see um, that, that the experience we've um, acquired <clears throat> and uh, I would say the success of the um, ESC um, as a common market has um, translated in, in uh, seeing um, you know our trade with with um, our, our our partner states in 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 the ESC uh, grow from from uh, you know uh, 340 million dollars uh, in 2009. Uh, to to half a billion dollars um, uh, eight years later, which is uh, roughly a six percent uh, growth per annum, and and our exports have also uh, grown uh, by by more than fifteen percent over the past nine years, um, which is something that we really think uh, you know speaks to 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 not only. Um, our efforts in making sure that we're part of, of regional integration, but but uh, also speaks volume on our on our wish, um, and and I think uh, SG Mene could attest to that to ensure that the CFTA becomes a reality and we have integration at the continental level. Thank you so much, Minister Soraya. Could you please now share a little bit as we ask the other panelists what's happened since the pandemic? How has Rwanda? Uh, responded. What are the prospects in the short term, uh, term? Of course, very few of us, if any of us, I don't think any of us can really see in the long term at this point. There's so many unknown unknowns. But we welcome your your reflections on Rwanda's experience since the pandemic. Um, so uh, we we had um, as as many countries or all countries in the world the dilemma on how 
do we deal with this pandemic while minimizing uh, the impact on our economy um, uh, and, and especially uh, the impact on, 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 on our SMEs, um, most of them being startups. Um, we had to take the decision at the beginning of, of the pandemic in our country, which was uh, mid-March, um, you know, to take bold decisions and, and, and uh, you know, put in place a lockdown, um, you know, close our airports because we realized very quickly that we could not allow our health system, um, you know, to, to collapse, especially without uh, being able to, to measure exactly uh, the extent of the pandemic. And from there, what we adopted um, to, to sort of curtail the pandemic uh, were, you know, strict measures uh, using um, mass testing, tracing, and also I think um, uh, being, I think, lucky in Rwanda that we have, um, I, I think, a leadership that, that you, we trust because it delivers results and, and the fact that through um, you know, those tight measures, uh, lockdown that lasted six weeks, and businesses that really uh, were hit. Uh, it's the fact that on the we were able to contain the pandemic. We're at uh, this time we have uh, less than 5,000 um, uh, cases. We've had, we were unfortunately, we, we lost um, up to now 28 uh, people, but it could have been worse without those measures in place. Um, but on the economic front, we uh, worked um, uh, to, to ensure that we put uh, rapidly an economic recovery uh, strategy in place, which also had a component of an economic uh, recovery fund um, geared towards um, uh, mostly um, our tourism and hospitality sectors, which as, as, as globally have been hit, but also ensuring that our manufacturing um, sector is also supported, uh, as well as our SMEs. And the last thing was <clears throat> working with uh, our, our partner states and the ESC to have harmonized uh, uh, measures to allow um, the movement of goods to continue, especially um, essential products, uh, be it medical supplies, uh, being uh, food supplies. And I think that harmonization, which from the first month um, through the ministers of health, ministers of trade, uh, foreign affairs, we really made sure that we can, uh, um, you know, uh, put in place uh, harmonize measures and, and continue be, um, supplying uh, not only our markets, but our citizens with essential products. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, Minister Soraya. Then let me come back to you, Secret uh, Secretary General um, uh, Mene. I'm going to go and I'm going to ask you the same question, uh, Minister Soraya and, and uh, Mr. Orian. Uh, if you had a magic wand and you could change one, two, or three things that you believe would fully unlock the incredible potential that is was already being realized pre-pandemic and will continue to be realized even with the pandemic, what would they be? Uh, you know, Minister Agbencici talked about corruption and that being the central thing that had to continue to be addressed. Uh, Secretary General uh, Mene, what would be one, two, or three things that if you had a magic wand, you would change that you believe would truly unlock Africa's full potential. Secretary General. Thanks very much. Um, let me, you know, let me start by, by uh, before I answer your question, let me congratulate the minister, uh, uh, Minister Soraya, because I think the, the measures that um, over the last 10 to 15 years that Rwanda has uh, put in place and the reform uh, initiatives are the reason why Rwanda is a success story today. And so as we talk about this agreement and what we, we hope this agreement will achieve, we want to look to Rwanda as a model in terms of how a country can position itself for investment, for industrial development, for the fourth industrial revolution. So I think it's critical. And I see parallels between the AFCFTA and, and the reform agenda of the FCFTA, because if you implement the trade agreement, you have to undertake reforms to align your domestic economy with the the, the market obligations of the um, of the agreement. And so I think I think we have a lot to look to uh, uh, in Rwanda. 
if I had a magic wand, which I hope one day I will have, we by now um, would have had all um, 55 countries ratified the agreement um, at this point in time. Because I think that uh, even though we have the fastest uh, agreement to be ratified under the African Union, um, 28 countries, we would still, we want uh, this agreement uh, uh, to achieve universality in Africa. We would like every African country to, uh, to be on board uh, from in a legal sense. In a political sense, it's supported, but in a legal sense, um, which means that they will undertake the reforms that are required. They will reduce barriers to trade um, so that we can uh, um, rapidly boost and increase intra-Africa trade. That would be my wish. The second uh, um, uh, wish that I would have is that we, um, we move rapidly. And this is part of my job uh, and my uh, colleague ministers. We move rapidly to um, uh, put in place uh, measures to advance Africa's industrial development. I had a conversation with um, a, um, one of the top uh, uh, global uh, auto manufacturers in the world, and they said to me, if in Africa, under this agreement, you can have a localization, a rules of origin regime that makes sense uh, from a value addition point of view, there's no reason why we should not move our production structures for component to Africa and across the African continent. And so um, I, I wish that um, we, we were able to, to move rapidly on some of the outstanding issues in the negotiations so that we can see the results um, that uh, Rwanda uh, has seen, the results that come from reforms and the results that um, you, you, you reap when you establish the requisite policy um, framework and legislative frame, framework for, um, for industrial development to take place, for investment uh, to take place. I think these are very, very important things that, that, I, um, that you know, are aspirational, but they also um, they are possible to achieve. Um, so, so for me, this is, um, uh, these are the, the top uh, wishes or aspirations, if I can put it that way. Oh, they're fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Secretary Nomeni. I want to go back to our Minister Aurelian from uh, Benin. Minister Aurelian, will you take the wand, as I would say, and care, uh, share with us uh, your one, two, or three uh, wishes you would make that would change and really be transformative, catalytic, uh, for not only unlocking Benin's full potential, but the potential of the entire continent. Uh, Minister, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you for your, your question. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, I first of all stress the importance of conducting reforms. And uh, when you are conducting reforms, you see quickly after an assessment that corruption is uh, one of the, 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 the serious diseases our countries uh most of them are suffering from. So this is one. Second thing, to have the audacity of reforming the context in which you are operating. Audacity, I'm using this word on purpose because there are sometimes some drastic reform that are needed. Uh, in some cases, you know, when we came in uh, almost five years ago, oh, I would ask some of my team or the president will have some department why are you doing this? And they will tell you, we used to do it. This is how we do it. And this process led to nothing. This process was not useful. This process was not answering to our, 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 our challenges. So uh, you need to conduct reform based on your reality. So create the conducive environment of conducting reforms in your country. And now, the, the, the third thing, and uh, uh, because I have the AFCTA secretariat here, secretary here with me, uh, it's important to understand that the little Benin or the little Togo or the little Rwanda cannot make it alone. What is the regional, what is the, 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 the pillar for integration? What can we do together? What can we, how can we have a kind of division of labor 
uh, 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 to make sure that first of all the sub region can come as one and 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 and, and make the difference, and then Africa as a whole. I, I, we signed this agreement, and uh, I, I, we, we're still working on the uh, with the Parliament for the the the, 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 the ratification process, which is taking time because we, we, we there are some threats that we need to mitigate. There are some risks to it. Um, when you see, for instance, a count, some countries which are not from the sub region uh, that wanted to be member of ECOWAS, for instance, and uh, those countries have serious industries. industries. Uh, when I say serious industries, that they, they can produce and they can even, if uh, you let them come in the integration uh, system in which we are operating, it can destroy the little economies. How do we organize ourselves to mitigate the risk of this type of integration? We know that the final, the final objective, we know that where we want to go is to have integrated and vibrant economies that are working together. But we need to make sure that the steps are, are carefully uh, 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 managed. And uh, uh, for, for, for that one, uh, I would say that uh, yes, five correction creates a conducive environment for the drastic reform, audacity of drastic reform, but make also sure that the environment, the integration environment is well understood and well uh, uh, taken into account. And last, last, very last one, what are the opportunity that you are providing to the youth? Because you have a problem of growth. Yes. We have a problem of democratic growth in our, in our, our countries. What are the opportunity for the youth? And uh, 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 that is something important because it's a time bomb, you know. Uh, yes. Youth in our country is a time bomb. And we need to make sure that we provide them with opportunity. We give them the possibility to be part of the movement. If not, uh, you see what happened in uh, Arab Spring, for instance. So we need to be careful and make sure that we, we are doing the right thing at the right time. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Minister. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Minister Soraya. We have our last three minutes. The wand is in your hands, Your Excellency. What are the two or three things that you believe will be transformative, catalytic in this new normal pandemic world that we live in for Rwanda, for East Africa, and Africa more generally? Minister Soraya? Uh, thank you so much, Sanjeev. And, and I will echo uh, what uh, Minister Ohelian has just said on um, the need to ensure that we have uh, not only jobs, but opportunities for our youth. Uh, and I think what will be transformational is really not only as governments or policymakers making sure that uh, we conduct reforms, but are agile enough to adapt the policies and the laws that we have in place to the new normal. Uh, but uh, also, I think ch changing the mindset on, uh, you know, there's one thing is to have strategies and policies that are magnificent, but the execution and execution rate is what will make the difference. And uh, here, I think Africa, as we embark in the, um, on, on this CFTA, um, which, which is a sort of a paradox where we see you know, uh, more protectionist um, sort of uh, for trend uh, in the world. But it's, it's, it's timely and it's crucial for Africa to really make this work so that we can represent more than the 3% of global trade that we currently represent. And, and I, would, I, would, I would end saying that it's, it's also a, a, an issue of changing the mindset, which takes longer, but the mindset that as a continent we can... Um, we can have that voice. We can execute the strategies that we've uh, so uh, rightfully designed and that our youth, uh, you know, is our future and that they, 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 we also benefit as any uh, youth in the world uh, from, from the opportunities and the untapped potentials that our continent has. Thank you so much, Mr. Soraya. One last, we have one more minute. I want to go rapid fire. One uh, piece of uh, uh, communication to the young people of Africa, the youngest continent on the planet, with all the great potential, but also the challenges that, that our minister from Benin shared. Uh, Secretary General uh, Amene, one sentence, the youth of Africa, what would you like them to hear from you? The youth of the continent must be part of implementation of this agreement and its benefits. 
if we don't include them, we will end up with the ticking time bomb that the minister wisely counseled against. That would be my assurance to the youth. They will be part uh, of this implementation of this agreement and its benefits. Okay. One really quickly, Minister Soraya, uh, uh, something you want to share with the youth of Africa. Um, I think for me, I'll be brief. You have all, all it takes and, 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 and as uh, policymakers or leaders, um, it's our responsibility, but you have to demand more from us. Thank you. And one last thing, Minister uh, uh, Minister uh, Aurelien from Benin, one sentence for the youth of Africa. They need to be demanding and they need part of the move because uh, they are not the future, they are already here and they need to be part of the change that we are conducting now. Thank you so much, Your Excellencies. I want to thank again our wonderful partner, Horasis, uh, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter. We at the Thunderbird School stand to, here to serve and partner with all of our wonderful colleagues here, uh, already with the minister in Rwanda, with uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General uh, Wamkele, and we know that the future is incredibly bright for Africa and therefore the world. Thank you all. Please stay safe and healthy in these difficult times.